Lord, I ask you to speak for your servants are listening. And we need every jot and every tittle, every iota, Father, that you could speak. We need it. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word of yours. Uh, and so, Lord, we need you to speak. Uh, we also need you to open our ears, for we are deaf at times, Lord. We are distracted. We are prideful, and we think we know. And we ask you, Lord, to uh, truly give us knowledge uh, that leads to life. The Holy Spirit asks you to speak today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise God. Thank you, Mason, for a Bible bag. That was great. Where is he? Thank you, Mace. Um, all right, so 1 Samuel chapter 3, if you have your Bibles there, please open your Bibles. Uh, even though we have it on the screen, it's good for you to just familiarize yourself with where it is so that during the week you can, you can uh, read it on uh, your own. Let me give a brief intro to the books of First and Second Samuel. I gave this intro last week, but I'll abbreviate it for this week. Uh, I said last week that a hot, a hot air balloon, if you've ever been in one, is both a fascinating thing and a dangerous thing. Because a hot air balloon is so easily influenced, and it's easily influenced by two things. Number one, it's influenced by how much hot air the pilot puts into the bag. But secondly, it's, in, it's influenced by the direction of the winds when you get airborne. And so for this reason, I told you that the safest way to fly on a hot air balloon, and the only way I'm, I'm ever doing it, is by, uh, with a, a rope that's attached to the basket. Because in that way, the, the direction and the trajectory of the balloon is dependent not upon uh, hot air, not upon the winds, but upon the thing the rope is attached to. And so we said, we use that as an, an analogy to talk about the books of Judges and First and Second Samuel, which are chronological in the Bibles. First and Second Samuel follows Judges. In fact, Samuel that we'll learn about today is the last judge. Uh, that the book of Judges talks about. So the book of Judges tells about uh, the devastation brought on a society when each individual is left to determine the height of his own balloon. Remember the recurring phrase in Judges that says, it said, uh, in those days there was no king, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Okay, But the book of Samuel, a little different, uh, there is a king, and so everyone doesn't do what is right in his own eyes, Everyone does what is right in the king's eyes, and depending on the king, that's either a good thing or a very bad thing, okay? And so, um, kings and rulers, even presidents, offer atmospheric sway to their kingdoms, and that atmospheric sway influences the trajectory of each balloon in the kingdom. In this way, it's a very real danger, again of each individual in society being allowed to pilot their own lives. The book of Judges taught us that. But there's also a very real danger of appointing kings over us who will so influence the atmosphere around us that all the balloons will crash anyway. And so here's the, here's the rope. Here's the rope that the book of Samuel uh, offers us. And it's actually found in the end of the book of Samuel. The book of Samuel ends with the death of King David and the Lord telling King David... Uh, that his son Solomon will build a temple for the Lord in the center of Jerusalem. So, the, so 2 Samuel ends with a vision of a society in which the temple of God is right in the middle of, of, of the city that will serve as both a rope for the king and a rope for the individuals so we don't fly off into oblivion. And so the book of Samuel teaches us that when the individual balloons in each kingdom are tethered to God, which means they obey him, they love him, they serve him, they worship him, and when the individual balloon, when the king himself is tethered to God, life can go well. But either one of those things you let go uh, his own way, and we're in very real danger. All right, so that's kind of a summary or an analogy, an analogous summary of what First and Second Samuel talk about. So today we come to our second story in the series, and it's a story of Samuel's call, right? And so I want to talk about three things, uh, three things that are in your bulletin today. Number one, I want to talk about a God who is personal. I want to talk about a God who speaks. And then thirdly, I want to talk about a God whose words never fall to the ground. A God who's personal, a God who speaks, and a God whose words never fall to the ground. Samuel 
is one of my favorite characters in the Bible because Samuel is a, is a guy that never backslides. Like David, we'll see him backslide with Bathsheba and in some other ways as well. But Samuel was uh, served the Lord faithfully till his death. And Samuel's life was mapped out for him from the start. His mother basically dropped him off at the boarding school for priests <laughs> at a very young age. And we don't know exactly how old Samuel was when his mother, we know he was weaned, uh, but we don't know exactly the act, exactly. Which, what, but but what we can uh, uh, learn from today, jo- Josephus believed. This is a Jewish historian believed that Samuel's call, as found in today's chapter, uh, Samuel's call probably happened when Samuel was about twelve years old. Okay, so mom and, and dad drop him off um, to be an apprentice of sorts to Eli the priest, and uh, and they only made annual visits to him at that point. Okay. And Samuel, again, was uh, about 12 years old. So Samuel's life was mapped out for him from the start, and he really had no choice in the matter. And you will notice that for some portion of time, Samuel served the Lord, so to speak, without even knowing the Lord. I want you to look at verse 7. Verse 7 tells us, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. In other words... There was a time in Samuel's life when he was working in the temple. He was going to church. He was going to youth group. He was uh, participating on the worship team. He was going to Camp Berea every year. Right? He was doing all the things young people do who know the Lord, and yet he did not yet know the Lord. Samuel was simply doing what his parents told him he had to do and what Eli the priest expected him to do, and yet Samuel's faith was not his own yet. And if you grew up in church, you know that there was a time like this for you too, right? There was a time when you were doing what was expected of you, but your faith was not yet your own. You were going to church, you did all the right things, but mostly because your parents expected you to do it. And the really encouraging thing that we see with Samuel, with Samuel's story, is that even though there was a period of time when Samuel did not yet know the Lord, there was never a time when the Lord did not yet know him, all right? And so there was a call on Samuel's life even before Samuel knew that God called people, okay? And I really want you to take, uh, I, want, I, want, I want you young people to take comfort in this because uh, in, in the fact that even if you do not yet know God personally, God still knows you personally. And what will happen for you, because it happens for every believer at some point in their lives, is that at some point, God will go from being a God you know about because you heard a thousand sermons about Him, and your parents talked about Him all the time, to being a God you know. At some point, your faith will go from knowing about God to knowing, about, to knowing God. And, and how this happens, I want you to know, for each person is very different. Uh, but if we could summarize how it happens, we see how it happens in Samuel's story. Your faith in God will go from knowing about God to knowing God when God chooses to interact with you personally. All right? So um, God will do something in your life that is very personal to you. And so uh, let, let me share what it was for me, at least one of the things it was for me. And it, it wasn't huge. Right, it, it, but it was personal to me, and it was enough to stamp my heart. Okay, so Marcy and I had just begun dating. I was seventeen; she was sixteen. I'd been a Christian for about a year, but I had really yet to apply my faith to all areas of my life, and yet, um, and I'd yet to really experience that God was personal anyway. And so, in this new relationship, I had a decision to make: was I going to apply my faith? to my new relationship, or was I going to date like everyone else dates? Was I going to commit to sexual abstinence until marriage and tell her about my faith in Jesus and what that meant going forward, or was I going to just keep doing the spiritual things at the spiritual times but segregate my faith to those times? And so I decided, my brother and I actually, because he was dating someone at the time too, I decided that I needed to apply what I knew of God's Word to this relationship. And so there we were, parked on a hill overlooking the town, probably 9 p.m. Friday night, full invitation since we were alone to date according to our flesh in that moment. But instead, 
I popped the question. You asked her to marry you at 17? No, I didn't do that. Uh, no, here's the question, though. The question was, what do you, uh, and, and I'm going to say it the way I said it. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 what do you know about God? That was the question. What do you know about God? Okay. And Marcy uh, knew little to nothing about God at that point in time. So in my infantile understanding of the Bible, uh, I proceeded to tell her what I knew about God and what that meant for our relationship going forward. And truth be told, it was an awkward conversation because I was awkward. Okay? And, but it ended well because it ended with Marcy saying, I don't understand what you believe, but I'm willing to go to church with you and learn about it. And from that point forward, she did. Okay? But here's the God becoming personal to me part. Up to that point in time, I was doing the right spiritual things because I was told they were the right things to do. I knew they were the right things to do. The reason I chose to even have the conversation with Marcy because I knew the Word of God was true, but I had yet to experience God as personal. So the very next morning after I had this conversation with her, I, I awoke I was sitting on the couch in the living room all by myself, reflecting on the night before. I hadn't told anybody about the night before yet. And for the very first time, I remember feeling an affection for Marcy I hadn't felt before. And at that moment in time on the couch, I truly felt God saying to me, Sean, I'm proud of you for doing what you did. So I'm blessing you now with a heart affection for Marcy you haven't felt before, and I'm going to make this relationship into something it could never have been before, and here we are. Right? At that point in time, God went from being largely in my head to being in my heart because he chose to interact with me personally. Okay? That's my story, and I want you to know that God will do this for you as well, but... You must keep wade, walking in his direction even though he hasn't done it yet. Samuel had been obediently serving the Lord for probably years before our story today, but God was not personal to him until this point in time. And in the same way, young people, or if you're just coming to faith and learn about the Bible today, you must keep walking in his direction, obediently doing what you know God's Word says to do at this point in time, even though... God hasn't interacted with you personally yet. So we serve a God, folks, who is a personal God. With each person who serves Him, He interacts with us personally. And the danger here, honestly, is to say, uh, is to uh, envy or to expect that God will interact with me personally the way God interacts with you personally. And He won't. He doesn't need to. Why would He? Right? It's personal. So, that's the first thing we see. We see a God who is personal. The second thing we see is a God who speaks, okay? And I want you to look at verse 1 again, back up. It says, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation, or your version may say vision, okay? So Samuel's life marks a time in history when God began to speak again. And the reason for God's silence was likely because for many years nobody was listening anyway. The book of Judges ends with an extremely dark time in Israel's history where everyone, was, again, was doing what's right in his own eyes. And so consider, I want you to consider, that even Eli, the priest, had been priest for quite some time. He's old. His eyes are failing. But even he got very little, if any, communication from the Lord. In fact, when God, God does communicate to Eli about his sons, he doesn't communicate to Eli about his sons. He communicates to Samuel about his sons, and he's the high priest, okay? Um, so um, Samuel appears on the scene of history during a transition time when God was again speaking. And so from, from this, I want us to notice something, uh, two things really. Number one, I want us to notice that, that we have a God who speaks. We have a God who speaks. And... and uh, um, we have a God who communicates to mankind, a God who is not silent, he's not mute, he's not deaf. Our God speaks and actually desires to communicate with us. And I, I want you to think about what a difference that makes to the world. Like if, if God is a God who does not speak or communicate with mankind, then we are left to guess about a lot of things. So for example, we're left to guess about right and wrong. 
What life is all about is a big guessing game. Who you are and what you are for is a big guessing game. If God does not speak or communicate with mankind, everything that ultimately matters to you is a guessing game. The only thing that's not a guessing game is the stuff that doesn't matter to you. Uh, for example, the laws of nature. Nobody lies awake at night losing sleep over the, over the laws of nature. They're a given. We don't even question it, right? You don't care about them. So what's not a given? Everything else. <laughs> okay? If God has not spoken, then although the laws of nature are still givens, the laws of people are not. And if the laws of people are all just a guessing game, then the truth is, your guess is as good as mine, right? <laughs> so we don't need God to speak to know that the laws of nature are absolutely true. Just jump off a ladder this afternoon and see what direction you go, okay? <laughs> but we absolutely need God to speak if we are to know if any of the laws of mankind are absolutely true. So, for example, laws about how people treat the environment are any of them absolute? Is it wrong, for example, for corporate America to intentionally pollute the environment by dumping solid waste into the oceans? Is it wrong? You may say, of course it's wrong. It will cause the next generation to live in a polluted, polluted world. Animals will die. People will get sick. We'll have poor air quality. And you'd be right. All of those things would eventually happen. But, but is polluting the environment absolutely wrong? Because all you've said is polluting the environment has bad consequences. Listen, working out too much has bad consequences, right? So he here's the dilemma. If God has not spoken, the laws of nature remain absolutes, but the laws of humanity are just a big guessing game. And if the laws of humanity are just a guessing game, then you really have no grounds for being so angry at the world. I mean, watch the news for five minutes, and uh, you will see that everyone's angry. And the only difference between stations, folks, is the people that we're angry at. If God has not spoken to us, we have no real grounds for being angry at all. Why? Because all we can say is, those people on that side are doing things I don't really like. So what? <laughs> You're doing things they don't like. Right? What you can't say, if God has not spoken, is those people on that side are doing wrong. You can't say that. If God's not spoken, there is nothing wrong. There's nothing right either. There are just things you like and things you don't like, and uh, it's all just a big guessing game, which honestly makes atheism totally self-defeating. The vast majority of people choose atheism uh, ultimately because they are angry. They see all the evil in the world, and they say there can't be a God, but that doesn't make any sense. If there is no God or if God does not speak, there's no such thing as evil. They're just things you like and things you don't like. So I love what uh, Ravi Zacharias said uh, once to a young man who, um, a college student, who was arguing that he can't believe in God because of all the evil in the world, to which Ravi asked the young man what he meant by evil. He said, because if you say there's such a thing as evil, you assume there's such a thing as good. And if you assume there's such a thing as good, you assume there's such a thing as a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. If you assume there's such a thing as a moral law, you posit a moral law giver, but that's who you are trying to disprove, not prove. So if there is no moral law giver, there is no moral law. If there is no moral law, there is no good. If there is no good, there is no evil. What's the question? You see the dilemma? Folks, we have a God who speaks, which means the laws of humanity are not a guessing game. We can know that some things are right and some things are wrong because we have a God who's communicated to us about right and wrong, and he's, of course, the final authority, right? And so, we have a God who speaks. He's not, he, was, he was silent for a while in Samuel's day, but beginning with Samuel, God began to speak again. So, we talked about a God who was personal. We talked about a God who speaks. And, but the main thing I want to gain from Samuel's story today is the, is the last point. We have a God whose words never fall to the ground. So now I want you to jump to verse 19. We're kind of skipping the middle of, uh, you know, Eli's uh, son predicament there. But verse 19 says this, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. 
And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. So what does it mean that God let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground? And this is because this is significant. Well, so um, the phrase in Hebrew for fall to the ground is a phrase that means to fail. Uh, For God not to let any of Samuel's words fall to the ground is for God to not let any of Samuel's words fail. And so, you know, for example, if you're taking a hiking, you're hiking on a trail and you eat trail mix as you're hiking and one of your peanuts falls to the ground, do you pick it up and eat it? Well, maybe some of you, but uh, for the most part, no, okay? If you're in the car, you know, then you grab it off the floor, Uh, but not if you're hiking, right? Um, That peanut, in a sense, has failed. It has become useless to you. It did not nourish you. It failed. God used Samuel the prophet so effectively that none of Samuel's words failed or fell to the ground. Now, here's what this means, and here's what it does not mean. I don't think it means that Samuel never said anything wrong. Like, I don't like to preach sermons that are crafted, that I crafted more than two years ago. You know why? Because they're too painful to read. I'll sometimes read through an old sermon and say to myself, I'm not even convinced that's true anymore. Now, you know, not the major teachings of the Bible, of course, but, but sometimes I've had to repent of teaching something to a group of people that either wasn't 100% true or wasn't 100% clear. And so for God not to let Samuel's words fall to the ground, I don't think means that Samuel never said anything he shouldn't have said. I think it means something else. So think about it this way. When you read the Bible, you are not just reading words about God. When you read the Bible, you are reading God's words. So when the Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed or uh, all Scripture is inspired of God, this does not mean that all Scripture speaks of God, although, of course, all Scripture speaks of God. For the Scriptures to be God-breathed means that all Scripture is God-spoken. God spoke the Scriptures. So, for example, in Acts 28, it says, The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our father, saying, and then Paul quoted from Isaiah the prophet, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet. So when Isaiah the prophet spoke, the Bible says he was not just speaking words about God. It says Isaiah was speaking God's words, okay? And so so, um, he was the mouthpiece through which God himself spoke, And in this way, even Isaiah's words did not fall to the ground. So how how can this be? So you and I, we speak all kinds of words every day that probably just fall to the ground, right? They, They fail. They have no effect. However careful we are with our words every day, the reality is some of them just fall to the ground. They pass away, all right? But Jesus said in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away, which is another way of saying that my words will never fall to the ground, okay? So how come God's word never falls to the ground, but ours so frequently does? It's because God's words and God's actions are the same. So think of it this way. If you walk into your house this afternoon after church, you walk through the door late as usual, whispering to yourself, I wish Sean would, uh, you know, shut it early with some of these days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you walk into your house and you say, lights on. What happens? Nothing. Well, one of you is in the room thinking, oh, I got an Alexa, Sean. Uh, the, only, the only way the lights turn on is if you take action after you speak and go find a switch, right? Um, our, words, our words and our actions are not the same. You cannot wake and say shower and without moving suddenly be showered, right? But this is not true with God. With God, His words and His actions are the same. So when God said at the beginning of time, let there be light, He did not go looking for a light switch. When God said it, it happened. God's words were the same as God's actions, not so with you and me. In this way, God's words literally shape 
reality. This is why Jesus could say in Matthew 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. How is it that mankind lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God and not bread alone? Because God's words are God's actions. The fact that we have bread is because God spoke. Okay? All of reality proceeds from God's word, not so our own word. Okay? In this way, I want you to hear this. It's going to sound wrong at first, uh, but it's right. You can refuse to listen to God's Word in your life. You can. But in the end, you cannot refuse to obey God's Word in your life. You can refuse to listen to God's Word in in your life, but in the end, you can't refuse to obey His Word. If, If you say, I don't care what the Word of God says, for example, homosexuality is not wrong. You can refuse to listen to God's Word, but in the end, you cannot refuse to obey God's Word because God's words and God's actions are the same. God's Word says the wages of sin is death. You don't have to listen to that. But I want you to know that in the end, you cannot refuse to obey it. Because God's Word says the wages of sin is death, the wages of sin is death, and you cannot get out from underneath death if you sin. That's not something you can disobey, right? We don't have to listen to God's Word, but in the end, we cannot refuse to obey God. So even right now, even right now, you are obeying God's Word without even trying. God spoke the world into existence by His Word. He created a world in which gravity keeps us on the ground, and you cannot right now refuse to obey that Word. You cannot say, I refuse to obey the law of gravity. God's Word has proclaimed gravity to be what it is, and you cannot get out from underneath it. You have to obey it. Samuel the prophet was a man God spoke through, and God made it so that none of his words fall to the ground. The result of this was that all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And what this means for pastors and teachers, thankfully is that even though I say dumb things sometimes, so long as I'm doing exegesis and not misogesis, God has the ability to use my words and cause them not to fall to the ground. So a 300-pound man with a squirt gun is no match for a 90-pound man with a bomb. It's not the person. It's the words uh, that are spoken. That's it's, it's the weapon, right? Samuel's words never fall to the ground because God made Samuel's words his words, and God's words and God's actions are the same. Now, here's the part I really want you to wrestle with and the part we'll close with. The Word of God can either break your life and, either, and, and ultimately destroy you because in the end you must obey it, or the Word of God can break your spirit and ultimately save you. The Word of God can either break your life and ultimately destroy you, or the Word of God can break your spirit and ultimately save you. The Word of God can either put an end to your life and bring ultimate death, or the Word of God can put an end to your pride and bring ultimate life. The Word of God is like gravity. If you defy it, it will break you. (laughs) But if you submit to it, it will save you. You may say when you look at the world today, the Word of God is out of date. It's narrow. It's for narrow-minded people who were prejudiced and bigoted. They didn't know about love like we know about love. But C.S. Lewis reminded us, he said, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. You think the Bible is out of date? The truth is you are out of date. All that is not eternal is eternally out of date. Let me t- Listen to me here. You too can be someone who never falls to the ground. How so? If God's Word remains in you. Or you can be someone whose life falls to the ground. You can be someone for whom the Word of God saves you, or you can be someone who is condemned by God's Word. You can be someone who is saved by God's Word. You and I can disobey God's Word forever. I can't, I'm sorry, cannot disobey God's Word forever. For, for, for the time being, God has allowed us to disobey it. But in the end, you and I must submit to His Word. His words and His actions are the same. The Word of God is like gravity. Defy it, it'll break you. Obey it, it'll save you. And so as we prepare to surround, and, and let me say this too. 
uh, we're tempted to be angry at the world too, right? And it just does, again, uh, choose a news station on who you want to be angry at, okay? And so that could lead us to say, God, you obviously don't care what's happening in this world, so why do I care about you? And you're angry and you become an atheist, okay? But I want to remind you of the gospel. The gospel says that God so loved the world that he came to do something about the evil in it. And the answer for the evil is the cross, right? So God's not so aloof from our pain that he's like, oh, get over it, guys. He, he entered the world to endure pain for us and ultimately overcome it in the cross. There's no other way than that, folks. So if you're, if you're angry at God, you're not seeing that he came to suffer for you, not make you suffer for him. So as we prepare to surround communion again today, let me ask you, do, do you desire to be like Samuel? Do you desire to be like, do you desire that God interact with you personally? Do you desire to know God and not just know about God? Do you desire that your faith go from cerebral to cardiac? If so, then your first step today is to begin to obey his word. Begin to obey what you know to be true according to his word. Samuel obeyed the Lord consistently long before he ever knew the Lord personally. You too, if you want to know God personally, must obey what you know right now. And you may not know a lot right now. That's fine. Obey what you do know. Okay? If you know the word of God but refuse to obey the word of God, do not expect him to interact with you personally. But if you will obey what you know to obey right now, he will draw you closer to him in time. Do you see what a difference it makes to our world to know that we have a God who speaks? <laughs> He's not silent. He's not made us to guess about the laws of nature uh, and the laws of humanity. Life is not a big guessing game. Because God has spoken, there is definitive right and there is definitive wrong. There are things that are happening in our world today for which we can say, I don't just not like what's happening. What is happening in some cases is just wrong. Okay? I do not just prefer things to be a certain way. I know that unless things are a certain way, those things are wrong, right? We don't have to be blown here and there by every wind of teaching because God's Word is eternal, and therefore God's Word is eternally relevant. If you believe God's Word, life's not a big guessing game. Do you want your life never to fall to the ground? Do you want Jesus to make your life like a tree planted by streams of water whose leaf does not wither, whose fruit is always in season? Do you want this? If you will let the Word of God break your pride and submit yourself to His Word, which are His actions, then the Word of God will save you. But if you will not let the Word of God break your pride, then the Word of God in the end must ultimately break you. We can't escape it. We must obey God's Word in the end. Is it time to let the Word of God break your pride? And so if the Word of God is breaking your pride for the very first time today, I want you to do something. I want you to come to me during communion and share that with me. And at that point, I'll probably have some next steps for you. If the Word of God is re-breaking your pride, perhaps you, uh, because of all the evil in the world, you made things worse for yourself by uh, jumping off of God's hand, as Mason said. If this is you, I want you to come to the front and kneel and confess your pride and repent. I want you to own it. I want you to let the Word of God break your pride. I want you to humble yourself. What is your next step today? As Don uh, plays, we're going to form two lines and take communion together. Uh, if it's appropriate for you, spend some time at the front. Come see uh, myself if that's right for you. And then I'll get back up and we'll take communion together. Let's commune together. If it's bandaging the broken,